This episode contains themes of mental distress and suicidal ideation that may be upsetting for some listeners. Please take care. Kia ora, I'm Jane Yee and welcome to This Is Kiwi, a podcast series brought to you by Kiwi Bank and the Spin-Off Podcast Network. In this series, I'll meet with incredible New Zealanders who've achieved remarkable things, uncovering what makes them tick and the influences that have helped to shape their ideas. Most importantly, This Is Kiwi will bring you knowledge for better. The incredible power of determination, passion and self-belief that we can all learn from and apply to our own lives every day. So join me on this unique journey as we celebrate the Kiwi spirit and learn what it takes to make a difference. This Is Kiwi, where ordinary people do extraordinary things. Today, I'm talking to Dave Latelle, affectionately known as the Brown Butterbean. He's a shining example of how one person can defy the odds to make a profound difference in the lives of others, and there's so much we can learn from him. He's faced a number of challenges throughout his life, but he refuses to let that adversity define him. He's been successful in his sporting career in both professional boxing and rugby league, but it's outside the boxing ring and off the field where his true calling has found him. Dave knows the power of transformation, having dealt with his own demons, and he set up the BBM Motivation Foundation out the back of that. And now he's become a beacon of hope to those who want to reclaim their health and future with free fitness classes, mentoring, and nutritional guidance. Not only that, but as a community leader, he advocates tirelessly for rangatahi, empowering them to break free from the cycle of disadvantage and embrace a future filled with opportunity. Over the years, I've read about Dave's work, I've seen him cutting up the floor on Dancing with the Stars, and I've had his videos pop up on my Instagram feed, but none of that tells the whole story. Being able to sit down and have an in-depth, raw and real conversation that goes beyond a list of his achievements and gets to the heart of who he is and why he does what he does was truly inspirational. But enough from me, let's get into it with Kiwi Bank Local Hero of the Year 2022, Dave Latelli. Kia ora, Dave. How are you? Very good, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a rainy, rainy day as we're chatting, and you've come in with worries about flooding at home and so on. This is real life. Yeah, there's always uh, something I'm worried about or, or numerous things that I'm worried about, and uh, but that's the nature of the work we do and the life that we live. We have so much to talk about, and I feel like we could probably do a Lord of the Rings style trilogy on all <laughs> of the things that you've done and achieved in your lifetime. Um, but let's start with being named Kiwi Bank Local Hero of the Year in 2022. Do you feel like a hero? Uh, I never think of myself as a hero. I've never, yeah, it's, it was awesome to get that award, especially being nominated from the people that you serve. Uh, it was great, you know, out of that, winning that award to form a relationship with Kiwi Bank and, and meeting Steve and, and the team there who continue to support us and the mahi that we do. Steve even, even donating um, a, a king size bed to our flood <laughs> efforts that he he no longer needed. It was a, a very 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 nice bed, so <laughs> a family member was very happy with that one that we gave it to. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think of myself as a hero. Just um, you know, if you can help, you should, and that's the that's the way we live our lives. But you know you're doing something right if you get named Local Hero of the Year. And I talked a little bit in the intro about some of the things that you've achieved in your time and the way that you've helped the community, but. If I was someone coming up to you on the street, never heard of you, and I was saying, hello, nice to meet you, Dave. What is it that you do? What would your answer be? Help people. That's it. We help people. We help give people a hand up. Um, Look, what I do is I was very blessed to have some people in my life that gave me a hand up. Um, You know, I moved back here in 2014. I didn't have not one cent in my pocket, and I was very depressed. Hated my life. I was, you know, over 200 kilos bad shape physically, worse mentally, didn't have my children. And some people that, you know, like an old league friend that opened up a gym just up the road here, actually Habitat for Fitness in Kingsland, his name's PJ. He played league with me back in the day. And when he saw me, he goes, what the heck's happened to you? (laughs) You know, and he said, come, I want to help you. I'm just opening a gym. Uh, If you turn up, I'm going to help you. People like that, Body Talk, Alex Flint, you know, Auckland MMA, there was just a a handful of people that that invested in me to give me a hand up with no expectation of anything in return. And that's all we're doing now is paying it forward. So if people ask me what I do, I just help people. That's it. And how integral is that for you in terms of your co-papa and helping the community, the kind of the people that helped you 
to get to where you are? I look at where I am now and, you know, we're very blessed. You know, we're living a, a, a nice life with my, my, all my boys back, a new wife and son, helping all these people and doing all these great things in the community. But it wasn't too long ago that me and my, my, my wife and three children were staying in a garage with no kitchen. It wasn't too long before that where I was staying in a sleep out uh, in a community home in Clendon. I was living with a rapist and a robber just out of prison. So, you know, I never forget those times and, and the struggle. And there was always people around that would come and, you know, like David Higgins and, you know, um, who really helped me. And, and even people that would just turn up to my house and uh, to the, to the, where I was, you know, the sleep out I was in and would just give me 50 bucks or would come over and bring some food. And it would always happen at just the right time because it was around those times where I was thinking, man, I, I, can't, I can't handle this. I can't handle having no money. I can't handle being broke and being tempted to go do silly things. Mm. And it was just always these people come around just at the right times, you know, through the grace of God and 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 just help me. And so that's what we do now. Yeah. Now you get to be that person for other people, mm. which is awesome. But when do you find time for you? Because I'm I'm the same age as you. <laughs> I've got, I'm, I'm ahead on you by a few months, but we're <laughs> the same age. And I'm looking through all the stuff that you've achieved in your 43 years. And I think, oh, I haven't done much. Um Dave's done heaps. <laughs> Where do you find the time? Because it's important to look after yourself as well, isn't it, when you're helping other people? It is important to look after yourself, but it's something that I'm still yet to master. Yeah. You know, I'm always chasing the infamous thing called balance. It's, it's, it seems like a myth to me sometimes, but uh, I am trying and it is very important, you know. So I'm, I'm like, I don't mean, I don't drink, I don't do anything, but my going to the pub with mates is training with my friends. Um, and that's how I sort of, that, that's my time. Mm, mm. Mm. And what about your wife and kids? Are they sort of, um, that, that's the tricky thing to balance too, right? There's yourself, but then there's also your whanau who you need to give time to. Mm. Are they on your case or do they understand completely? And well, the, You know, it's hard it's on my family. Mm. Uh, anyone who's is married to someone who's in, in this serv- service um, of others in the community, unfortunately, look, it's, you know, they're, they're the ones who miss out. Yeah. That's the hard thing. You know, I battle with it. I really battle with it. It's on my conscience. Look, I, I think the thing that would really help you get some time is if other people stepped up and helped as well, right? Mm. If there was more community focus by everyone in Aotearoa, then there wouldn't be so much pressure on people like you. How would you like to see people helping others in our country? Well, it's, it's not really complicated. It, it's more for me what I'd like to see is the government supporting more community-led initiatives. Any social issue you'll see, there'll be a community group, you know, trying their best to help with next to no resource. You know, th- just support those groups. You know, really, our model that what we've done in BBM is community business, you know, out for the, with the likes of QBank and foodstuffs, companies like that, uh, and government working together for the common good. It's just really what I'd like to see more is government supporting community-led initiatives mm. that are actually working and stop supporting these large organisations that are just filled with bureaucrat and are achieving nothing, and then we wonder why nothing's changing. And Dave, you, I mean, you spoke just before about still trying to figure out how to find that balance to be everything to everyone and look after yourself. It's it's a really hard thing for literally anyone to do, let alone someone who's got so much on their plate. And I think that just really speaks to the fact you're still a work in progress, right? Like we're all still a work in progress. And there's an element of being able to give even when you need support as well, right? You know, there's we've all had a really rough few years and for some people it's been a really rough few decades mm. and even longer. What would you say to people who just feel spent and like they, can't, they don't have the capacity to help? What are some of the small ways that people can help their community? Oh, man, small ways. I mean, it's, it can be just a matter of volunteering some time at, at, at your local food bank or, or just even the most simple way of supporting a group like, like us is by even just sharing one of their posts mm. or sharing all their posts, you know, and liking and commenting and tagging people in the power of social media. That, that, that engagement is, is currency for people, for organisations like us. 
Um, so that's the most simple way of helping a group like that is just engaging with their posts. It's like, you know, sometimes you see you, you're starting a new business and your friends never like and comment. You know, why? Like it's the most simple way your friends can support your new business mm. is by engaging on your content, you know. So that is the most simple way, I reckon. I feel like now it's an opportune time to tell everyone to go and review this podcast and to share it with everyone because, you know, there's going to be some amazing <laughs> messages coming out over the course of the series. Where did this drive to help others come from? Because, you know, there were you've had some rough times in your life. You've spoken to when you came back from Australia and things were hard. For a lot of people, when things are hard, the last thing they do feel like doing is mm. helping others. So where does your drive come from? I don't know. I've never been asked that question I before. can't believe I'm the first person to ask you that question. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Because I want to yeah. know and I want to copy it. <laughs> um, I think it's just something deep down inside uh, me that just wa- I just want to help people. I hate seeing... I mean, I think it comes from me understanding what it's like. I mean, my life's been a roller coaster and mm. I've lived, you know, multiple lives. Mm. And I just understand what it's like to have nothing. And I understand what it's like looking at your children and having no food, no money. Um, and I just, I never forget that. And that's why I just do my best because I, d- I don't want families to have to go through that. You know, and if I can help, um, I will. And I just do everything I can to help as many families as I can. You know, that's it always comes down for me is the children because children don't have a choice of where they're born into, right? And so many times people say to me, it's their choice, Dave. I say, it's not the kid's choice. That's rubbish. You know, so if we want to, if you have a heart and you want to help these children, you have to help the parents. You know, that's just have, what we have to do. If we want to break the cycle, we've got to think of those children and their kids. We've got to think of this next generation coming through. Um, so that's what drives me. It's just that I've never forgotten the feeling of having nothing. Mm. And it's not even always the parents' choice. Mm. You know, they might be in charge of day-to-day decisions, but once upon a time they were little kids yep. born into a situation as you know, well. I've spoken to people that just say to me, you know, they come from a long line of nothing. Mm. And I try and encourage them and say, look, you, you, it's, it's not a long line of nothing because our ancestors weren't nothing. Our ancestors were strong and that's where you come from. Um, you know, we can break the cycle. Um, it's, but, it's, I mean, it's hard. Are there any particular uh, cases that you've dealt with that really stick in your mind um, that have had a massive impact on the work that you've done and your motivation? Oh, there's been so many. Uh, we're helping a family at the moment whose son, 15 years old, is uh, was 230 kilos when he started with us, 15. The mum messaged me at one in the morning, I just finished work, help, please help us. We meet them and I just said to the mum, it's not your fault. You're so busy trying to survive, trying to put food on the table, trying to keep a roof over your heads and you're working every shift possible and you just don't have the time. Mm. You know, so I'm here to help you. You know, stories like that, it's just, it's just constant. It's, over, it's, it's overwhelming for me. It's just nonstop people crying out for help. You know, um, we gave a wheelchair to a family last year. They couldn't, last week, couldn't get a wheelchair for their old 70-something-year-old father who's sick. Can't get a wheelchair. How does that work? You know, how are we, you know, so, so we got them a wheelchair. You know, it's just the, oh, it's just so much, there's so much suffering out there at the moment, people just don't even understand. They don't. They don't. They don't see it, um, and it's not their fault. Bubbles existed before COVID. Mm. We people up here, people here don't know what's like going down down the bottom. Yeah, it's heartbreaking hearing you say this stuff. I think of my own family. Mm. Um, I am so privileged in so many ways, and this is stuff that I can't imagine. Truly, I can't imagine. People have difficulty asking for help at a time when mm. they're, it's, it's kind of the most obvious time to ask for help, right? But actually, on the day-to-day, there are people struggling and suffering constantly. Um, it's really easy to kind of look around during a, a, a flood or a cyclone and go mm. look at the very visibly obvious things that need to be done. But there's a lot of stuff that's not obvious to a lot of people that you see every single day. Yeah, people that were struggling before COVID and before the floods is just worse now. Um, you know, 
we had a volunteer come yesterday to help us on Sunday to do some par food parcel deliveries. And we were at the Takapuna, we're at the lodge where the lady was staying, all, all around Rewa. And I, I just warned them. I said, look, you're going to see some pretty confronting things mm -hmm. here. Um, the main thing is we never judge. We never judge what, when we're going into and we just listen. What else do they need? You know, that's that's what we're there for. It's just like a well-being check as we're going in delivering food parcels. Um, yeah, day to day, it's what you see is uh, it's pretty confronting. Mm. And it's the children. Mm. That's what gets me. It's children. You know, we, get, we're, you know, we helped a guy a couple of weeks ago who's, um, you know, just thousands of dollars behind in rent. And he can't do it. He can't pay it. And he's trying to repay uh, the rent plus a little bit extra to pay back rent. And like when their rent's $1,000 and they're two young parents with with uh, two kids, how the heck are they going to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, and they just and, – and we helped. Um, but because of the children, you know, that's, that's it. That's just for the kids. Do you see your own kids in the kids that you help? Yeah, I mean – me and my son Brooke were at the food share yesterday, and I just I just look at my kids, and I just think, um, thank God, you know, I feel very blessed. Um, but then I I still have that guilt for my older kids, what I put them through. Mm. Um, but then I see where we are now, uh, and I feel I just feel um, blessed that my that we're not in that situation. But it's very important that my children understand that so many people are. So that's why I have mm. them working. Uh, with us at the food share so they can see it. They have to have that understanding. I, mean, I remember I was staying at my sister's house and I was on a bed I couldn't fit on and I was staring at the roof thinking, how did I fuck my life up so badly? I just was so depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would always dream, this vision would always come in my head and it was the last time that I saw my son Savita as they were walking off, him, him and his uh, brothers and his mum, you know, we split up because I was an idiot. It was my fault. Um, but as they were walking he, to the train station and he looked back at me and the look he gave me was like a look like he knew he wasn't going to see me in a while. And that look just fucking haunted me. It just haunted me, this look he gave me. And I just, man, I just... But I, I, I didn't use it as an excuse to stop. Yeah. You know, I used it as... as Fuel. I said, I have to have my fucking kids back and I'll stop at nothing till I get them. You know, I have to be a better dad. I have to be a better example for them. And I just got to work, working on myself. You're mm. making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's always when we talk about kids, hey, because yeah. I've got three kids as well and it's, um, it's such a huge responsibility. Mm. It, it's such a huge responsibility. Hearing you talk the way that you are, even about this stuff is inspirational because you are trying to do your bit, to change it. And um, I didn't expect to sit in this room and be affected the yeah. way that I have been already. So it's quite, it's quite amazing. You're quite, you've got quite an amazing aura about you, Dave, and um, I know you're a very humble man, but you've achieved a lot and I know that you've got no signs of stopping. What, you know, what is the big dream? The dream... Uh for BBM is for us to be everywhere. It's what we do should be everywhere. What we've created is like a village, a community, a marae, like society used to be. That old saying where, you know, it takes a village to raise a kid. Well, unfortunately, now that's gone because everyone's so busy trying to survive, but we want to bring that back. Mm -hmm. So we want to have these, these hubs throughout the country uh, where you have everything there, the exercise, um, which is the connections, the vehicle to get people together. You know, you have the kitchen, you have the food share or the social supermarket. Uh, you have, you know, your counsel free counsellors and you have, you know, free lawyers. It's just everything's there under one roof that, and we want to have those throughout the country. Mm. How do you think um, Maturanga Māori plays a role in this and how can all of us benefit from the Māori worldview? Yeah, look, the model that we that we use is te whara te pawha. You know, it's, mm. it's really everything. Health is not just exercise. It's mental health. It's your whānau health. It's um, having access to food. It's it's having access to housing, all these things. And that's what we've created. Um, and, and you see these models um, throughout the country, um, little models like that. that. That's what works. So if we can create that throughout the country and have these hubs, these, you know, really are 
wellness hubs, complete wellness hubs, using Te Whare Te Pawha, yeah, this country will be in such a better place and it'll be happier because that's what it's about. You know, we want to be healthier mm-hmm. and happier. That's the secret because you can. it's not about losing weight and being miserable. It's about being healthy and happy and having your family there to train with you and eating together and just enjoying life. It's interesting because there is, you know, you already mentioned about like not overcomplicating things and that is a really simple take. Mm. Um, and I think we do have a tendency to overcomplicate things, put a lot of red tape in place and that kind of thing. Call that bureaucrat. Yes. <laughs> Great term. So, you know, how do we get through the red tape? We have to trust the people who know what they're doing in terms of resourcing, right? And it's really difficult to do that. People, someone asked me that before. It was another um, uh, awesome, um, it was a student mental health group from down at Canterbury University, I think. And uh, they, ca- they came up to me and they said, had a meeting with them and they wanted to know, how do you how do you deal with red tape? And I said, I don't. <laughs> I mean, that's as simple as I can put it. I don't deal with it. Um, I just don't worry about it um, and I just do the work. What I did say to them is you've got to do the work but you've got to make sure you're keeping data, has re- you know, so it's all, all the evidence, you build your case. And so I think one day the government will come around and understand that you've really got to empower these groups. Mm. Of course there has to be some level of reporting. Of course there is. But you've just got to not be uh, con- confine them. You know, I want I want to be. I think you can be a part of the system and be resourced by the system, but not be confined by it. Mm. You know, and not be there just to tick boxes and just to fit their narrative. We know what works. Just support it. Yeah, and data is helpful, right? Like data, data can be very helpful, yeah. but it doesn't tell the full story because numbers aren't people. Yeah, you know what I realised early is that you know to the health system, we are data and money, and that's it. Um, I remember going to try and get funding for things that I was doing early on, you know, and people say to me, where's your data? So, well, do you not follow me on Facebook? You know, <laughs> have you not seen all the before and afters? And so I started keeping data, especially through this program we caught, do called From the Couch, which is helping two, three hundred p- kilo uh, members of our community that have lost all hope, um, have all t- types of long-term conditions, and we help them to, to regain control of their lives. It's been evaluated by Massey University, so we have this evidence. But the evidence is not just numbers, it's stories. You know, like, for example, we started out west last uh, three weeks ago. Last week, a guy comes in, he goes, I drove myself here. I can fit in my car and drive myself. Yeah. You know, the stories like that, that's powerful. It's not just X amount of weight loss. This is a story of a guy who now can get out of his house on his own and drive himself somewhere. And it puts it into perspective for other people who haven't been there, right? Because I can't imagine, you know, it's easy for me to get in and out of my car, it always has been. Mm-hmm. And then I hear that and I'm like, never thought of it that way, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I couldn't tie my shoelaces before, even just simple things like that, you know, walking. Uh, you know, for a lot of these, a lot of the people we help, if they fall over, they're in trouble. You know, you've, you've got, they've got to call the ambulance if they just fall over at home, you know. So that's what we're trying to do with this program. And that's the program that we want to, you know, really replicate throughout New Zealand from the couch. You're an athlete. You oh, have used to be. You used to be an athlete. <laughs> Once an athlete, always an athlete. But you love exercise. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you must come a lot of, across a lot of people who don't used to have the same passion for you know exercise as you do. Yeah. Look, uh, exercise for me is my therapy. Mm. It's that's that's what it is. Uh, you know, I'm not training to have a six pack. I'm training to be happy and to, to get frustrations out. When I started my journey, I got up off that single bed I talked about earlier. I borrowed my sister's car, borrowed petrol money, which was humiliating. I drove to One Tree Hill and I went for a walk. I went for a walk around the summit and it was such a beautiful place. And I, while I was walking around the hill, I was no longer thinking about how crap my life was. All I was thinking about was, man, this is a steep hill. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> why did I choose this place? But afterwards, I had the natural endorphins of, of exercise running through my body the natural endorphins, and and my brain had had a chance to rest. It wasn't thinking about things, so it could handle life for a little bit more. And that's what I talk about to people. That's what exercise is about. It's not about training for a marathon. It's going for a walk. Walk with your family somewhere beautiful. Just take your mind off things. That's exercise, you know, and, and it's so beneficial for you. And once you get in the routine, it's it's, 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 it's awesome. It's it's the eating that's that's the hard part. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of food. I love Me all delicious <laughs> things. I got terrible self control, um, but it's really important when you're making 
changes in your lifestyle that they're realistic changes, right? Yeah, like, you know, it's not about never having a treat again because it's you can, it's, it's okay to treat yourself once, twice a week, but if you're treating yourself every day, that's mm. no longer a treat. Mm. You know, that's just the way you eat. So it's about making sure you've got the right mindset about it and it's bit by bit by bit. You can't live your life on chicken and broccoli. That's not living. You know, that is not living. You, know, you can't just live your life, you know, live on such a strict diet so you can have a cool Instagram photo. That's not what it's about. It's about being healthy and happy and being able to maintain that lifestyle. And part of that is enjoying life. Is there a particular community you have a heart for? Because you're, you're helping all sorts. Yeah, look, we're based in South Auckland and West Auckland, but basically I have a heart for any any deprived, struggling area throughout the country. I always talk about my people. Uh, I'm half Samoan and half Māori. Mm-hmm. I don't just mean Māori Pacifica. I mean anyone struggling, anyone stuck in a rut, looking up, thinking life's impossible, that's my people. And I encourage my people not to stay down and wait for the system to help us because if you're going to wait for the system, you'll wait all your life. You know, anyone struggling is my people. You've had a real, you mentioned a real roller coaster in your life. We've touched on you being an athlete. You've enjoyed some success in sport that many people could only dream of. Um, but you've had a tough childhood as well. You know, we've talked about parenting and you had a period of your, your life where your dad wasn't around. What impact did that have, have for you? Yeah, look, it's, I mean, it still has an impact on me. My, mm. my father was the president of the Auckland chapter of the Mongol Mob. And it's, um, you know, he wasn't around for a very long time. He was sentenced to 10 years when I was five for, funnily enough, this this podcast for Kiwi Bank, and he was he was in prison for robbing banks. But, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was crazy. It was a crazy thing to be born into. But the, mm. the issue is that we thought it was normal. And that's the problem with, with yeah. all these children that are being born into this life. They don't know it's that it's not normal, that what they're living. Um, and, and that's the issue. You know, so when people are, are looking at these families, you've got to understand these kids, this is what they're born into, and that's their normal. Then those kids become the adults. If we don't step in, it's going to go round and round and round. If we think it's bad now, imagine the kids of these kids, mm. you know. If you look back at your yourself, I guess, maybe around that two, 2014 time, and you were to show Dave, 2014 Dave, a, a vision of what's happened here, would you even believe it? Oh, man, that's another good question. I don't think I would, just seeing where we are now. Yeah, it was, was, that was a real tough time. Mm. Um, Yeah. Dave, what would you tell that, Dave? What would you say? Because I guess there's things that... You know, you'd need to steal yourself for for what's coming, mm. but also to encourage that younger version of yourself. Oh, I don't know. I just, you know, say just to keep having faith and that it's going to be okay. Um, to just continue to get up, don't give up. That's the, the main thing I'd say. Just don't give up because there was times throughout that early days where, man, it, it was getting, you know, I was coming close. To just saying, you know, fuck this. Mm. Uh, um, yeah, some some dark times, you know, where I was thinking that this is just not, not worth living. I can't do it. Um, so I was either not going to be here or I was going to be in prison. That's what was going through my mind. But, you know, I just say just stay focused on your children because that was my why. Still is my why. That My, my why was I'd close my eyes constantly and I just envisioned being at the airport and having my arms out with my kids running up and hugging me. And um, that that's what got me through. Just And then when that day happened, it was the next, just um, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. You hold on to that forever. Yeah, yeah that was that was an amazing feeling, that's for sure. Mm. Can you stop making me cry, please? It's, <laughs> it's just, absolutely. You're killing me over here. Um Dave Latella, you've achieved so much. You've done so many amazing things for so many people. And I know that you're not going to stop. <laughs> you're going to continue. What's the one thing that you would like everyone who's listening to know about you in terms of encouraging, you know, what you've learnt in your journey in terms of encouraging them to get out 
and help others? Yeah, look, I just encourage everyone that's going through tough times at the moment, and there's lots of people going through tough times that, you know, I really want to encourage that greatness can come from the struggle. You just got to embrace it uh, and not be tempted to take shortcuts because those shortcuts are always the long way around um, and just keep working. You'll get there. And when you do get there, never forget where you were. So it's always good to come back and help others, you know, and trust me when I say you'll always be blessed in return. When you help others, you're going to be blessed tenfold. So, and, and the feeling you get, you know, when you help just one person, people overcomplicate and they think, I want to help as many people as he's helping. Just help one person. And that feeling of helping one person, it, was just, it just fills your heart and you want to do more. Kia ora, Dave. Thank you so much for coming in. This is Community. This is Kiwi. This is Dave Letelian. <laughs>